And we are back with more on Stock Saga 960. So very glad you could start your work week right here with us on the Mark Petroni Show. And it is that time again when we get schooled, as it were, on crypto, Bitcoin, and all the others. And uh, who better to do that? I mean, last week, of course, we had a real rabbi uh, teaching us. We had Michael Karras on the show, the author of a, a great new book for kids that, you know, grownups can get a lot out of. But now we also have Benjamin Dichter as well. And he has maybe a different kind of take, but uh, his is uh, no less valuable. And that's why it's a lot of fun bringing Benjamin on the show to help us out. Because, of course, there are no shortage, Benjamin, of people coming out and saying Bitcoin is dead. You see, it fell over the last 48 hours. And yeah, that's the go. end. The end is nigh. And uh, we've heard this story repeatedly over the last uh, however many years it's been around, and it hasn't stopped. Uh, the latest is a uh, professor out of Cornell, very left-wing uh, institution, by the way. This guy's name is Eswar Prasad, and the CNBC brought him on. He's professor of international trade uh, policy at Cornell University. He spoke with Squawk Box, and he said Bitcoin itself may not last that much longer. Well, here we go. More doom and gloom from people who say they know all about crypto. Before we bring you in, shall we listen a little bit to what this guy had to say, Benjamin? If, if we really have to. <laughs> you want to subject me to this nonsense again? All right, well, go I, ahead. You, you've got to respond to it. So here we go. Here's the professor uh, opining on the fact that crypto, that the Bitcoin itself may not last much longer. Many fintech platforms that are undertaking um, intermediation that would traditionally be done by commercial banks and also providing low-cost digital payments to the masses in a very easy way. But, you know, the real legacy of Bitcoin is not going to be that cryptocurrency itself, but the blockchain technology, which I think is going to be fundamentally transformative. That's what the, the Chinese communists done, said. And in the way we conduct day-to-day <laughs> -day transactions, like buying a house, buying a car, a lot of this mm -hmm. is going to be Word for word, by the way. Much better <laughs> using blockchain technology. Now, it turns out that Bitcoin's use of the blockchain technology is not very efficient. It uses a validation mechanism for transactions that is environmentally destructive, that doesn't scale up very well. Uh, we but there are new technologies that are developing <laughs> new cryptocurrencies that are using blockchain technology much more effectively. Okay, so let's stop there for the time being because mm. we may come back to the professor. He I says, also think, by the way, I think it's funnier when you talk over them because it shows how ridiculous <laughs> they are. Like, they're just clowns. The guy's a clown. You know, I, my first comment would be, there's an old expression that apparently intelligence services use, which is some things are so, mind, so mind-numbingly simple that even some academics can understand it. I think that would apply <laughs> to this guy. But yeah, go on. Well, okay, so his take is... Uh, to be fair to him, okay, um, he says, yeah, the blockchain is good technology. This is valuable. <laughs> we can use this. This is the future. But Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, they're not part of it. They're not using it efficiently. They're not using the, uh, the blockchain in a way that it should be used. And so, as you mentioned during your uh, spiel, during the guy's speaking, he's mm -hmm. basically mouthing the same... Uh, you know, communist jargon that you hear out of Xi Jinping's regime. And so here we are, a professor coming out and saying, Crypt uh, uh, the, the blockchain's good. I'm with you that far. Cryptocurrency, not. Over to you. Yeah, a Cornell professor with communist sympathies. I'm shocked. Wow. Uh, he's doing it uh, exactly word for word. The uh, Chinese government a couple of years ago put out a handbook to its citizens, a PDF file or whatever it was, and sent it around the country, regurgitating exactly this point. Oh, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin bad, but blockchain good. Translation, translation, Bitcoin's great. We just don't control it and we don't like that. So we want to make a carbon copy that we control. And by the way, we're going to remove all the advantageous attributes of Bitcoin, but we're not going to tell you. We're going to call it a CBD, uh, CBDC, Central Bank's Digital Currency. Um, and, I mean, I can go on. This sort of stuff has been going on 
uh, in Bitcoin for like, I know I can tell you're already annoyed and you're new to this. Can you imagine <laughs> being in Bitcoin for years and every time it goes down by, you know, 8%, 5%, 10%. It's, oh, let's, let's roll out the ones on the take from the CPC and have everybody tell them, have them tell everybody why it's all bad. Whatever. More yeah, well, this, well, this guy made these statements. It wasn't even recent. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that they posted, they reposted it on their website because it sounds like this guy, yeah, earlier this month. Well, here we are in, uh, you know, later on in December, and this guy is talking about, and, and uh, these guys at CNBC are posting something that uh, that happened that he said earlier. We could be going back a couple of weeks. And so I'm, I'm wondering what their uh, modus operandi is here, probably because uh, Bitcoin, uh, well, basically is it took a little bit of a hit. Let's hear a little bit more about what he had to say. I know you don't want to hear it. But well, I, th I think also what's appropriate for this is that old uh, axiom, if you say it enough times, eventually people believe that it becomes fact. Who said that first? I can't remember. It's some regime yeah, from Germany. Wanted that. Yeah, I, yeah that was, I, can't, uh, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> was it Goebbels? I, can't, I, I think it was Goebbels. Uh, let's, mm. let's listen uh, again to what the professor had. Goebbels, who also, by the way, had a PhD like this guy. But anyway. <laughs> Not that having a PhD makes you a Nazi, but let's listen. So yeah. I think the promise of decentralized finance using blockchain technology is a real one, but Bitcoin itself may not last that much longer. Of course. <laughs> and Dr. Prasad, it's, it's almost impossible to argue with anything you're saying. I, I thank you, by the way. For the it's impossible to argue it. <laughs> There's only one opinion. You can't have more opinions. This is the internet. This well, is you, media, you know. You heard him. It's impossible. <laughs> what you're doing, arguing against him, is impossible. It's, it can't be done. What you're yeah, doing, clearly they didn't spend much time in deba debate club. It's but physically <laughs> impossible what you're doing. It's impossible uh, to have a counter argument. It's impossible. <laughs> Let's hear his next question, shall we? Bitcoin yeah. and skepticism of fintech, and they're completely different things. And I think you're alluding to that as well. But, but completely a great lie out there, isn't there, amongst many Bitcoin adherents? They're pretending they think it's all about what transactions it could power in the future when what they really want to do is just see an asset go up. But no currency in history has just gone mm -hmm. up forever and maintained success. Yeah, uh, like fiat currency. Of, of transition of, uh, yeah, so the very people who are <laughs> slagging Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are losing sight of the fact that uh, fiat currencies are in big trouble right now. And all you have to do is look at inflation uh, at the degree to which many of these are gradually losing strength in the marketplace, but he's painting all of you with the same brush there. It's like, you guys are deluded. You know, all you're after is increasing prices in order to increase your net worth because as Bitcoin goes up or cryptocurrencies go up, then, you know, I guess your value, your overall value goes up. And so that's all you're at really after here is he's diminishing uh, people who have cryptocurrencies as people who are simple investors looking for astronomical uh, gains, that's the, that's why I heard that question. I mean, I don't know what the what the professor's response is, but have you heard that one before? Is that anything new? No. Can we start calling the fake news the obnoxious news? Like it's getting obnoxious <laughs> at this point. It's the same thing. There's no creativity on their side. It's the same failed argument that anybody who understands on a basic level how this stuff works, can refute it, and they don't care. They're just going to plug plug along with the same propaganda over and over. They're not addressing any of the attributes of Bitcoin. If you notice, they don't uh, steel man what Bitcoin is. They don't present the opposite argument. Their only argumentation is Bitcoin bad, everybody knows it, and you can't even argue it without even explaining why. Let's the hear the typical. response. Let's hear the response from the professor now. Uh, of goods yeah. and what have you. For instance, the dollar hasn't, the yen hasn't, the pound hasn't, the euro hasn't. Surely there is a great lie out there that actually people who hold Bitcoin just want it to go up rather than have it for more that's, transactions. That's you he's talking about. That's right. With yeah. any asset, the question there is where go. is the fundamental value proposition? And given that Bitcoin is not serving well as a medium of exchange, I don't think it's going to... Um, have any fundamental value other than whatever it's interesting how he scripted the professor's okay. opinion before he answers says oh yes of course 
not well, like fake news media is scripted. By the way, just so you know, I have a friend who used to go on CNBC all the time. And he told me the stories of what crap it is. That's why he doesn't go on anymore. He explained the way it works in not just CNBC, but a lot of these mainstream media panels now. They'll give everybody an earpiece. And this is what happens in, in CNN with Zucker. The producer is sitting there whispering in their ear saying, OK, cut him off. Give him a counter argument or support his argument. Like they're like like little gestures. They're telling them what to say. And if you if you haven't seen it more evident like this, like look exactly what he's doing. He's setting up the professor with his own opinion. And again, not addressing any of the attributes of Bitcoin or any of the counter arguments. Not one. Zero. Any counter argument is is to be dismissed. Well, that's pretty creepy what you just described. I'm not at all surprised that that's the case. I have no, yeah. no doubt that, that goes on at CNN. They're pushing a narrative and they're brainwashing the turtle. public. Yep. And what he's saying, the professor just said, is that uh, Bitcoin doesn't serve as a means of exchange. So basically saying you can't buy stuff with crypto anyway. So what's the point? And as yeah. a result of that, it has no intrinsic value. In other words, the lack of usefulness of of Bitcoin renders it for all intents and purposes worthless. Yeah. So we could go on to, you know, any of the, the blockchain um, websites that actually shows real time transactions. And we can watch the transactions going on on the blockchain that are occurring right now. And I'm sure between the time that we've just spoken, we started listening to this nonsense. Yeah. There were at least several thousands of transactions that were just processed people buying Bitcoin, people bought, selling Bitcoin, people using it for transactional purposes, people putting it into things like BlockFi uh, so they can borrow money against it and earn 9.5% interest on their money. Link is in the description of this video. Um, so yeah, he said, oh, nobody's using it. <laughs> well, you can see it on the blockchain. Well, that doesn't count. I mean, this is pure, pure propaganda from the uh, legacy financial system, nothing more, which is not surprising coming from uh, CNBC, which they're known for this. Well, here's what I don't understand. This guy knows that. Of course. I mean, how can he say something that is so blatantly false and have the person asking him the question, nodding his head uh, like one of those dogs in the back seat of a car in the rear window <laughs> saying, yeah, it's not really happening when we know for a fact that that is a bald-faced lie. I mean, I don't understand what is going through his head. What is What are the thought processes here from people who are saying things which they know are 180 degrees from the truth? Unlike these leftists that we're watching, I don't want to project their intention onto them like they do to all the Bitcoin people. Oh, you're there just for the financial gains, just for the rise in price, which is not actually true for a big chunk of Bitcoiners who are libertarian, who want some, some sovereignty from government control. You know, especially those, those terrible people who live in author authoritarian regimes like China, who want an alternative where they can hide their money. Such bad, terrible people. They're just for the gains. No, maybe they're there for the freedom because that's something that they don't have. So unlike them, I'm not going to project on them, but I would suggest in many of these cases you follow the money when you follow the money then you find the intention of why people are doing it maybe it's for reputation maybe it's for more airtime on the news who knows it could be a, a million things or or he just could be completely out of his mind and clueless who knows well maybe they're trying to set off a stampede out of crypto because when you look at that when you look at that uh post in cnbc the second bullet point is Bitcoin's price has been highly volatile over the last few years. And in the last month, the price <laughs> of Bitcoin has fallen from around $58,000 to $48,000. And so what, he, what they're saying is you better get out now. Save what's left of whatever money you've gotten invested in this thing before it's too late and you get stuck holding zilch. Let's listen a little bit to what else he has to say. Leads oh, to have. But you know, there is an interesting um, you don't like me. currency competition. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what. You know what we got to do? I no, gotta no, take it's a, a break. No, okay, I got to go take on. a break. I got to take a commercial break anyway. 
I want to give you a break as well from listening to this idiot. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but stick around. We're going to be back with part two of our interview with Benjamin Dichter, our week to week crypto rabbi right here on Saga 960 <laughs> and the Mark Petroni show. Don't go away. And we're back with more on News Talk Saga 960. So very glad you could join us to start your work week with us right here on the Mark Petroni show. We have Benjamin Dichter on the line, our cryptocurrency guide. And uh, one of the things that guides do is they poke holes in the statements uh, from academics, people who seem to think they know what they're doing. They go on to places like CNBC and say things that CNBC wants them to say, in this case, bashing cryptocurrency. We can only speculate as to why they're saying that. But I think an easy guess is that they're trying to prop up the dollar, which uh, has been taking a beating over the last six months or so as we see the value of the greenback tumble in terms of what its ability to buy actual stuff. And uh, so let's listen a little bit more to this uh, individual. His name is Aswar Prasad. He is Senior Professor of International Trade Policy at Cornell University. I've been to Cornell and it's a, it's a nice place. It's a beautiful campus, but uh, I think uh, you know a, a communist would certainly be very much at home well, and I think Mark Dice refers to CNBC accurately when he calls it uh, constantly nothing but crap. So this is a good example of that. <laughs> Let's listen. ...that it has set off. Um, there are stable coins now that could, in principle, create more effective ways of transacting um, in basic ways. Uh, in addition, I think these cryptocurrencies have really lit a fire under central banks to start thinking about issuing digital versions oh. of their own currencies. Oh, yeah. And that could be good in many ways in terms of providing oh, an amazing. additional payment option, um, a low-cost payment option that everybody has access to, increasing financial inclusion, and potentially also increasing financial stability. Inclusion. So again, much as we might not like Bitcoin, I think it has really set off a revolution that ultimately might benefit all of us either directly or indirectly. Okay, so here's his thing. He's saying, yeah, cryptocurrencies... A Bitcoin is worthless, but it, uh, its presence in the marketplace may have done some good, some very good, because it has lit a fire under the central banks, which could now issue a digital currencies that would allow them presumably to track every uh, transaction. So by definition, <laughs> then it's not worthless. It's yeah, completely so worthless, but it's changed the world. Okay, the so it's worthless. Yeah, but if the central bankers do it, Benjamin, then it's good, right? Uh, if the, yeah, the central bank right. good, crypto bad because we don't we can't control crypto we can't yeah. control bitcoin whereas mm -hmm. the central bank we can control that we know who those people are and we can trust those people let them issue the digital currency and everything will be great yeah well <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say other than he should have a red nose and a multicolored wig on his house <laughs> with a horn under his arm I gotta ask you about that make America, make Canada great again hat. I mean that is uh, that's that's fantastic. Oh, because I, I was looking for a make a Canada not communist again hat, <laughs> but I couldn't find one. So this is the closest thing I could find. All right. So the idea that somehow it has created a revolution, but the revolution really should be aimed at changing what the federal bank is doing and changing and uh, bringing on uh, centrally controlled digital currencies get this crypto stuff out of there use the blockchain in order to move towards a digital currency that's what this guy is saying we're saying the financial equivalent to martin luther's 10 oppositions oh. to the church but on the state wow. level we want separation of state and money just like several hundreds of years ago they wanted separation of uh, church and state. That's what's going on here. And they are, uh, the financial system is behaving exactly uh, like the church did at that time. So okay. you know what's going to happen? You know what's yeah. going to happen? They're going to lose because the economics always wins. And when the economics is favorable to the individual across the globe, people are learning more and more, especially with this, this COVID stuff, that their governments are full of crap. They're not going to, only Western, the people in Western nations don't realize their governments are full of crap, but they're now learning and they're going to start to ignore them. This is why with all the COVID, you know, stuff, for example, uh, sorry, the Cerveza sickness, uh, 
when people are like, oh, you know, the government, no, the government has no control. The only control they, that is being exerted right now are people in your friends, your families, and your neighbors. If all of them turn on the government, the government has zero control. The only control they have is compliance. That's why during this Christmas season, I hope everybody listening will be around the dinner table and talk to their family about freedom, that the government doesn't have control, whether you agree with the degree of the, the cervasa sickness or the medicines or whatever, that's up to you. But we all have to agree on freedom for everybody around us. And once people realize that consensus, the government's powerless. The dollar will hit zero with Bitcoin at $40,000. That story from thestreet.com. Okay, oh, yeah, a, Jim Cramer, the guy. The guy. <laughs> wow. Jim has gone all, con all in on communism here, saying that the state does have the power to push whatever they want, including whatever treatment they have in mind for the cerveza a sickness. Dollar will hit zero with, with the Bitcoin uh, below $40,000 in 2022. So... I don't know. This isn't uh, Kramer. This is somebody else. This is say this guy's saying that the dollar is headed for for zilch. So he's he's suggesting that the collapse of the greenback is imminent. That's a prediction mm -hmm. for 2022. The chief executive of crypto exchange Kraken, Kraken, yeah. sorry, Kraken, says the dollar is going to crash, and Bitcoin will see its price fall dramatically too, as part of that tumult. Jesse Powell urged investors this week to prepay healthcare and tuition expenses and take on more U.S. debt. The quote in this story, Benjamin, maybe I should stop making predictions. I'm going to say the dollar is going to zero. You should start stocking up on gasoline and milk. So this is the apocalypse scenario here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, you know, go home and, uh, you know, Go off grid, uh, get a firearm, learn how to skin a deer, and good luck to you, every person for himself or herself. Yeah. Um, also, a couple of things. The reason I mentioned Jim Cramer is because Jim Cramer owns the street. That's his uh, publication. Why? Well, that doesn't sound like something he would approve of, though. I uh, no, that... he's no, he would. He's um, he's actually gotten into uh, the Bitcoin space a while ago. Like, you know, we make fun of him for his uh, communist stupidity with the vaccines. Sorry, with the medicine for the surveillance. <laughs> <stuff. laughs> um, right too, my friend. I don't know. If yeah, exactly. Be... One more and we're gone. It, it must be the red hat that's doing it to me. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's strike three right there. Um, Jesse, who's the CEO of Kraken, if you if you see him, he looks like he's twelve. Uh, he's a computer programmer. He's a bright guy. But uh, I think the doom and gloom predictions, much like the predictions on the legacy media side, are a little bit overblown and hyperbolic. We do see that out of the crypto side a little bit as well, that people predict this doom and gloom. I like George Gammon's take uh, because it's a lot more thought out and researched and he's using data coming from the Fed uh, as much as we know that we can trust that we're going to go through this, um, these peaks and lows of inflation down to deflation, back up to inflation. Like there's a lot of things going on in the world that people don't realize, like the euro dollar market, which is American dollars in Europe, uh, just for simplicity. You know, when you buy a house or you buy property in the U.S. and you're a business, you're doing it in, you know, U.S. dollar equivalents. That's the U.S. dollar, US, US, um, the euro market. Euro dollar market. Uh, there is a shortage of cash uh, in the euro dollar market, and there has been for years. There's a, a sh there's only uh, the supply accounted for is only 27 percent, if I remember correctly, of the euro dollar market is actually backed. So that cash needs to go somewhere, and the Federal Reserve is trying to figure out how to supply the euro do dollar market. Uh, euro dollar market. That's also part of the rationale behind all the printing that, well, we got to figure out the mechanism to get there, and they don't really have a direct mechanism because it's an old, antiquated system, and it's not digital. So there's a lot going on there. Um, I don't think we're going to be in the apocalypse now, uh, next week, next month. I think people should be prepared for 2008. 
Um, but I also think the rebound might be a little bit quicker because of the increased digitization. But I don't know. I, I don't want to make that predict prediction. But I think it's wise for people in general, and this is why I'm a proponent of this space, to scale down um, their spending, scale down you know, their living habits. You know, If you have three cars and you can get by with two, have two cars, right? Like those sorts of things. Um, just be a little more prudent with your money. And I would suggest everybody buy some, uh, some, some Bitcoin. So they have, you know, a portion of their portfolio is put in this, is hedged in this asset. That's a sovereign asset. And yeah, maybe everything will go down. Maybe the stock market will go down by 50% or 40%. And maybe your crypt, your Bitcoin will go down by 10 or 20%. But that's also why I say, you know, adjust your time horizon. One of the th things that the guy made, the statement this professor made, whatever his name was, um, he said, Bitcoin has been volatile for years. Okay, well, that, part of that is the network effect. And the network effect does introduce volatility into anything. Any, you know, the law of diffusion of innovation is based on this, right? But um, if we look at the price of Bitcoin a year ago today, I believe it was... Fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars on its way up. Today it's forty-eight thousand. So it was sixteen thousand uh, twelve months ago. Twenty-four months ago, I believe it was six or eight thousand dollars approximately. So this, uh, you know, this fairy tale of oh, it's so volatile. Yeah, but if you average it over the twelve or well, I just had its bar mitzvah actually. Uh, Bitcoin's gonna have its bar mitzvah on January third. Uh, if you look at over the the 13 years of Bitcoin, its average is increasing 200% in value every year. That's what it's done. So yeah, okay, volatile day to day, week to week, whatever. But you're buying this for the long term. And I like the quote by um, uh, this guy, Cedric um, Youngleman, as he said, if you could buy 100 years of your salary, for around forty-seven to forty-nine thousand dollars, would you do it? It's an interesting question because if you have a long-term time horizon, and the Bitcoin blockchain continues doing what it's doing, uh, multiple governments have tried and failed repeatedly to ban it, and now you have bipartisan support of it in the United States, whether it be uh, you know Ted Cruz, Cynthia Loomis. Uh, the mayor of Miami, a number of towns across the U.S. Like the, everybody understands that this actually could be the solution to this, um, the fiat system that we have, which we know is not sustainable. We know it's not sustainable over the long term. And I'm willing to guess that at some point enough people will be in government that will say, why aren't we using Bitcoin as a reserve asset. And there's a survey that just came out, and this is the last point I'll make, and you can interrupt me and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but there's a new survey that came out uh, in the last um, last couple of weeks, I believe, that 83% of millennial millionaires own cryptocurrency, 83% wow. of them. And the next generation after that, they're not gonna know paper money. Why would they? They start earning money when they're, they're kids playing video games whether it's on their iPad or their PS or their PlayStation or whatever. And at some point, like we're starting to see the signs in the gaming community, which by the way, is 3 billion people play video games. Uh, whether, whether people like video games or not, it is a huge demographic. Well, you're starting to see cryptocurrencies and NFTs entering the video game space. That's how people who are younger start streaming and some of them have become millionaires by their late teens or mid twenties with some, a few of them. Right. But there's a whole lot of them that are earning, you know, an additional side income in uh, cryptocurrency. What do they want dollars for dollars is a pain in the ass for them. It's difficult for them. All right. Now that you've taken a breath, you can have mm. a look at the screen uh -oh. and answer this question it is, does this uh, gold is up for the last, it's, it's had a great, had a great week. And I realize, once again, you're talking long-term time horizon. But this this was a really good week for Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff is is almost at the I told you so stage because of 
you know, the recent decline in cryptos and the great week that gold just have has uh, has had. And so this gold, I mean, I take your point about the longer term time horizon for crypto. I'm with you there. Mm -hmm. Does gold play any role in that for you? Is it worth it or not in your view? I, I think it, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like smartphone operating systems or gaming system. Are you uh, a desktop gamer or console gamer? Are you an Android or are you an iPhone guy? It's just what you're comfortable with. And I think it's a generational thing. I think older people are more comfortable with Bitcoin and for obvious reasons, not sorry, with gold and for obvious reasons, not as comfortable with uh, Bitcoin. And I don't fault them for that. It's, uh, there was an, um, an amazing interview I watched. Um, I can't remember this woman's name, Melissa uh, something. She's a financial uh, advisor from Northern Ireland who was combing over a lot of the data around the cervasive sickness and the illness. Um, but as she was explaining that uh, she's much more on the gold side, but she, you know, she owns cryptocurrencies and, and whatever. Um, as the she Irish said, lady. Uh, this is yeah, the Irish right. lady, yeah. Yeah, she's from Northern Ireland. Yeah. She is, uh, as she said, uh, gold is where you go to hold on to your assets, to save your money, right? To protect it. And I think gold is good for that. So as much as, you know, I, I told you, I like Peter Schiff, even though he frustrates me. And I think he knows he frustrates a lot of people. But it's because the people who are in the Bitcoin space and the gold space they have very similar worldviews and often the identical worldview. It's just mechanisms that are driven by generational gaps. That's all it is. And I, and I would see that, yes, Bitcoin is definitely more speculative because it doesn't have a history of, um, of, of Bitcoin. But we also do live in a time, uh, you know, the, the age of technology, where we progress more in 10 years than we've progressed in the previous 5,000 years. So I don't think it's a linear scale that you can compare. Uh, I do think both are valid. So I would not, you know, gold, I'm more of a digital guy, as you know. Gold for me is a little bit of a pain in the ass because it's got to be stored somewhere and whatever, fine. Uh, that's why I lean far more towards the digital side. But whatever you think is right. But All right. He, there will be more gains with uh, Bitcoin just because it's new to the market. And unlike gold, like imagine you are uh, somebody who's a middle class or poor, uh, poor class living in, I don't know, El Salvador, Florida. <laughs> well, Florida. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's go a little bit more. Let's say Latin America. Let's say Argentina right. or whatever, right? Yeah. How are you going to go and buy gold? Even if you had a little bit of money, how are you going to do it? So what, the in El Salvador, you could probably go out and, and mine it. <laughs> you go pan for it. Yeah, but then everybody would be living there. No, but the point is, if the, the, trend, the transaction speed, which, you know, this guy complains about the transaction yeah. speed of Bitcoin. The transaction speed of gold is, is what, two weeks to buy gold if you want to go buy it? Um, and it's very limited in scope into who can access it. The 8 billion people on the planet will never have the opportunity to buy gold but they will have the opportunity to buy Bitcoin because all you need is a smartphone and you can buy $10 of it. And we look and say, okay, $10, what's that? Well, that's a day's salary in many countries or, or, or a week's salary in some countries. So for them, yeah, it is more significant. Benjamin, thank you. I got to wrap it up, but I really appreciate right, this as always. All right, Benjamin Dichter, our Bitcoin and crypto rabbi, our guide. <laughs> no. And, I don't have to uh, pay us like Michael does. <laughs> uh, I got to wrap things up on Saga 960. That's it for the uh, for the Monday edition of the Mark Petrona Show. Appreciate you tuning in. Let's do it again tomorrow, shall we? Stay safe. Be good. See you then. Bye-bye.